All right, still have sounds? So close, so close. Plus the fact, I think I have a ton of stuff I was going to show today too. So, so that should be fun. All right, for reasons that you will discover in moments, we are going to do attendance in a little bit, but let's go ahead and get started. So density charts and functions. Uh, so announcements, remember checkpoints due today, uh, accommodation should be sent to us by the 11th, um, and then you should be done with the project by uh, whatever Thursday next week. Um, and just keep in mind, we had to shuffle some of the groups around. We had a couple of people drop. We had a couple of people uh, wanting to switch discussion sections, et cetera, et cetera. So just, you should be aware of them. We should have sent them as emails. Uh, if you still have any open questions about like trying to switch discussion sections or, um, you know, making sure you have a group and where it is, uh, please post it again. I think we think they're all complete. Okay. So. Uh, just uh, let us know again if you have any challenges. Any questions? All right, one of the things that you really need to move to earlier in the semester, I think, uh, is um, where you can find documentation, okay? So um, the two biggest tools, I think, uh, most uh, kind of software developers of any kind, whether you're a data scientist or a you know day-to-day -day programmer, uh, are a website called Stack Overflow and another website called Google. You're probably familiar with Google. Uh, if you have a very serious hobby, you might also be familiar with Stack Overflow. Uh, for example, if you're into photography, the Stack Overflow for photography is like crazy good. Um, so, but they uh, kind of got started around technology stuff. So they're usually a pretty good site to search. Most of the time when you Google search any question in technology related land, it will often reference you to Stack Overflow. Uh, so, how many people here have used Stack Overflow before? Okay, how many people have used it for non-programming tech-related stuff? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, all right. Um, and just keep in mind, if you go and sign up for an account there and answer questions or like questions, whatever, you get points. So, if you, if you like collecting those internet points, uh, you can do so at Stack Overflow. Um, and I have heard stories of people um, kind of kind of noticing it when they see an inbound resume, um, you know, of like, oh, this person posts all the time on Stack Overflow. This might be a person we want to talk to. Um, so it's not as prominent as things like GitHub and stuff like that, but I have definitely heard of it before. Okay, so, but the real thing here is often you don't necessarily, you want to go and find out, I'm sorry, Rohan, should we have sound? Are we good? Okay. Um, so sometimes, you, you don't always know the question you want to ask, right? You kind of just need to read something and try to get an idea. That's what the real documentation is for, okay? As usual, we shorten it because God forbid we type anything out. It's almost always just docs, okay? And docs is kind of a broad spectrum term, okay? It's, but generally speaking, documentation. So the data science module um, is a good place to go. So that's a, what we use a lot. That's where table comes from, for example. Uh, and so if you go look at the docs there, there's a little bit of uh, prose as well, but then it also has the actual documentation for each of the things. Um, and then we also use NumPy a lot. So wherever you do NT, for example, that's actually another module or library called NumPy. Um, and it's just, you know, numerical Python is what it's short for. Um, and it has now just become NumPy. Um, so, I think we're typically using version 1.19. It hasn't changed very much. So if I'm slightly off, that's probably okay. If you're slightly off, it's probably okay. Uh, sometimes it matters, right? Because some, you know, there might be a new ability for NumPy and a later version than an older version. So you might want to make sure that you're on the right version. So you can just check that. But it's usually embedded in the, uh, in the URL. All right, questions? All right. Uh, no, is nothing going to work? So normally I really like Khan Academy. 
Uh, and so I was going to show this video. Then I kind of watched it again and was like, this isn't really adding any value. So I'm not going to show this video. But I like Khan Academy and recommend it to everyone here. Um, so, well, I thought I wasn't going to show it, but apparently I am going to show it. Let's see how I get to the next slide without it showing. Um, So I am going to show this one, and with any luck, we'll actually get some sound. That's my hope. What do y'all think? Is it going to work? I have never done it in here, so who knows? Uh, it'll also probably be incredibly loud, just to make things more fun. So what I wanted to show this for was because one of the unique, one of the differences between a histogram and a bar graph, if you look at the graph, like the picture itself, You'll notice on a bar graph, there tends to be a little bit of space between the bars, okay? And on a histogram, there isn't. Does anybody have a theory about why that might be? There is a reason. It's not just like aesthetics or something. Right, so the data in a histogram is actually continuous, okay? Or should be. Um, you know, if you, if you skip a class or whatever as you're going along, that's probably not a good idea. But this is going to show a little example and one of the reasons I'm using this video is because I often think it's helpful to hear the same thing from somebody else. So this is pretty similar to the stuff we've talked about, but maybe it'll help understand it a little better. And hopefully we'll be able to hear it. How's that? Oh, this did not start where I wanted it to. My bad. And the check-in time is going to So I'm asking, what is the number of people who are waiting more than 40 minutes to check in? So if I come along and draw in the line here, I can see I'm interested in all the people that are to the right of 40 minutes. So I want the area of all of this. And like we said before, the area of the bar tells us the frequency. So I'm going to do the class width times by the frequency density. In this case, it's going to be 5 multiplied by 2.8. Say 2.18. He's way smarter than I am. There's no way I would have gotten 0.18 eight there. Gives me 10.9. I'm going to round that to 11. And the area of this bar will be, again, 5 multiplied by frequency density, which is 5.8. So 5 multiplied by 5.8 gives me 29. And then finally, this one is 10 multiplied by 1.5, which is 15. So adding those together, we get 11 and 29 is 40. 40 and 15 is 55. Question two, I'm asked to, hi there. In this video, we're going to look at how we can interpret this thing around. Way smarter than me. All right. So uh, I just wanted to show you kind of another example and takes advantage of that continuous uh, data, right? If you notice, right, there was no line at 40. He went and put one in because he wanted to calculate everything over 40, which he could do with a histogram, but you wouldn't be able to do with a bar graph, for example. That makes sense? All right. And then this one, uh, I just thought this uh, is another interesting use of a histogram. Um, instead of, it's not so much about like kind of using one as much as why a histogram is so interesting um, because other statistical techniques in this use case didn't work. I also think the story is really interesting. Good music might be the best part. By the 1920s, people had killed off the last of them. And the interesting thing happened to the cotton they produced after the last of the wool crop. Typically, a forest has a lot of young small trees and a few older large ones. 
But after the wolves were gone, the older and larger trees remained while the smaller and younger ones disappeared. And to try to figure out why, the scientists proposed this cool paper, they proposed two hypotheses. Either a change in climate was making it hard for young cottonwoods to survive all over Yellowstone, or young cottonwoods were being eaten by too many elk. See, one of the things that happened after the wolves were gone was that the number of elk increased dramatically. Since elk like to eat tree species, more elk could mean less cottonwood trees because they were being eaten. To distinguish between these two hypotheses, scientists measured the diameter of cottonwood trees in places where the elk were able to go and in places where the elk were not able to go. If the climate hypothesis were true, then small cottonwoods would be missing from all locations because the climate change affects the entire park. But if the elk hypothesis were true, then small cottonwoods would be missing only in places where elk were able to go. Here are the results. So in places where the elk could go, the average tree diameter was bigger. And that's what you'd expect for the elk hypothesis. Because if the elk are eating the small trees, then there's fewer small trees in the sample. So the only trees left to sample are bigger trees. So the average tree diameter should be bigger. But the problem is, when you only look at averages, you can't tell what's actually going on with the small trees in the sample. Because you can get a bigger average in places where the elk could go, because there's fewer small trees, or because there's a few really big trees in those places. And that would bring up the average in both cases. And so you can't actually tell just by looking at the average what's going on with small trees. You need to look at the distribution of tree size. And that's where a histogram comes in. Here are the same data shown as histograms. For each histogram, the scientists took the diameter measures and divided them into size categories. Then for each size category, they counted how many trees had a diameter in that category, and they plotted that number. Then they did the same thing for all the size categories for all the trees. The tallest bar tells you which category had the most number of trees in that size. At the site where the elk could not go, there were a lot of trees with small diameters. But at the site where the elk could go, there were many fewer, like none, of the smaller cottonwoods. So it's many data and a whole lot of other data combined to support the conclusion that the young cottonwood trees were not growing in Yellowstone because they were being eaten by elk. And interestingly, in 1996, wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone and pretty quickly the elk population went down as the wolf population went up. And as the elk population went down, the young cottonwood trees population went back up again. And that is how wolves help the trees grow. Yeah. All right. Now I broke it. I'm sure it's really going to want to run through it again. So let's see if we can convince it. No. All right. And then this last one I wanted to show you because it's really actually what I was looking for, which is trying to show an example, but it's not going to start at the right minute, is it? Uh, shoot, let me see where I have the right minute. Actually, why don't we just, oh, actually, sorry, I, I misrecalled which uh, video it is. So let me just separate these windows somehow. All right, and then we're going to maximize this. And so I just thought this uh, was a pretty good summary. Um, and it actually starts a second or so back. So let's see if I can get a couple seconds back. There we go. So this is kind of just a summary of histograms. Um, the first one I showed is actually the closest thing to what I was actually looking for, um, but I thought it was Are you actually going to do your thing. Come on, YouTube, you can do it. Instagram is a, the bar chart used to display the variation in continuous data that's grouped into intervals, which are also commonly called bins, particularly in Excel. It's a type of frequency plot, and the x-axis plots continuous data that's grouped into intervals or bins, and the y-axis, the vertical axis, is either frequency or percent. What we mean by frequency is either the number or the count of cases. Right. The data can be printed. 
theoretically, I have a positive there. So what I wanted to point out is that that y axis, okay, is I think confusing for a lot of people from a labeling perspective. It can represent one of two things. Um, it can represent either a, a raw count, okay. So in other words, there in interval three, there are whatever eight, 19 things in here, okay. Um, or it can represent a, per, a percentage of the total population. Okay, so if you have way more than you know whatever all these numbers added together is, um, what you might want to do is show it as a percentage of the total population. Okay, and so it can mean it can be either one. And I think the labeling can often be a little bit confusing about which one it is. Um, so you kind of have to use a little bit of, you know, thinking about what the terms say, as well as maybe thinking about the data set. You know, if you if you know you have 10,000 items and you have a bar chart that looks like this, you can make a pretty good guess that it's not 20, right? It's not a, a fixed 20. Uh, do you have a question back there? Yes, but it but the problem is is that is your result a percentage of the whole or the actual whole or the yeah or the actual value? Make sense? All right, any questions? All right, I'll play the last little bit because otherwise I'll feel guilty for not playing her whole little clip here. And this is by an order from a survey, and it's best to have a sample size of at least thirty observations or at least thirty cases. So traditionally, in a histogram, the bars actually touch. So that's the summary of that histogram. All right, we're not actually about to do some quizzes, despite her opinion. Get rid of this. And I think that was the last video, but invariably, this will try to play the next. This one again, I think. Yep. Is this it? There we go. All right. So now, because I want the most complicated day I can possibly get, uh, we are going to throw this over here and get rid of that. And take attendance. And I'm just going to minimize it kind of immediately uh, so we can keep going. And in my other window. All right. So uh, if you couldn't figure it out, Top Hat couldn't play the videos very well. So that's why I'm switching back and forth between things. Uh, so density. So we talked about that a little bit. Um, but kind of just talking about it again you know, from kind of a slightly different perspective, height measures density, right? So uh, the number of chips in each bin is the height of the number of chips, right? Um, and sometimes they're not all stacked on top of each other. They might be stacked next to each other, but you get the idea. All right, so these are another way of doing it. You're just seeing the same thing. It's just that your, your bin is wider, at least drawn wider, okay? It may be exactly the same value, it just is drawn wider, so the bins are like this. Or the items are like this. Reviewing, there's that little bit of math. So the height is equal to the percent in the bin over the width of the bin. The height measures the percent of data, um, and the height measures the crowdedness or density, uh, and the units are the percent per unit on the horizontal axis. All right. So what does height not measure? All right, get those answers in. All right, and we have some responses. All right, most of you said how many times to copy a table, and that is correct. All right, I think we have one more question. So now you're just going to fill in the formula. Uh, so, yeah, I still understand. I can't, I can't figure out this. 
how it works. But A, B, and C, so which of these goes in which there? But I presume, can you see, can you see the graphic locally, like on your laptop or your phone? Yeah, okay. All right, answers. All right. So here's the correct answer. So A is the height and B is the percent in the bin and C is the width of the bin. All right. All right, and so that we also talk about the area, which measures the percent. So the area of the bar is the percent in the bin, the height times the width of the bin. How many individuals in the bin? You use the area. How crowded is the bin? You use the height. Okay, because that kind of, if you remember back to the, the first two pictures, right, the, the height is different, right? And so if you want to know how many individuals there are, they were the same. But one, the height is lower. So that's not helpful. What you need is the area because in that case, the, the chips, right, are next to each other instead of all stacked up. Make sense? Okay. And keep in mind, right, as we showed in that first video, I think, yeah, like that, that area works across bins if you want it to. And uh, that Khan Academy video uh, actually does show a really nice job of this part. Um, but not kind of taking into account the rest of it. All right, so kind of recapping charts. We have scatter plots, which is the relationship between numerical variables. We have a line graph or a line plot or a plot, or it has, for some reason, has grown 87 different names, um, but that's sequential data commonly over time, okay? But not always, but often. Uh, and then you have a bar chart, so distribution of categorical data. And then histogram, which is kind of like turning numerical data into categorical data, but it is the distribution of numerical, numerical data. Can't talk. Uh, and so that's what you use a histogram for. So it's important to remember which one to use when. Um, and so there you go. Here's a brief synopsis. All right. As you might have guessed, there is now a question about which one to choose. All right, get those answers in. All right, so what I want to point out is be careful with the histogram. Trick question here. A histogram is like turning numbers into categorical data. It is not. Okay, it is a numerical distribution. Okay. Sometimes the word like actually means similar and isn't just an expression that you use in the middle of a sentence uh, just to connect words together. All right, so what's the best plot for so showing sequential data?
All right, final answers. All right. And we have line graph, which is also correct for most people. All right, if you did not get either of these correct, you should definitely go back and reread that last slide. All right, so this one is all of them. So you're gonna match the plot to the data they primarily work with or the graph to the whichever uh, to the uh, type of data. Um, yeah, you will you will often hear me use the terms graph and plot, uh, you know, uh, relatively interchangeably, even though there is a keyword of plot. All right, get those answers in. I know these are tougher because there's like matching and stuff, but. I will tell you one of the hardest things to do is stand here while one of those videos plays. It's like waiting, waiting, waiting for answers. Also very difficult. All right, last chance. My patience has gotten the better of me. All right. So responses. So the correct answer was uh, one to C, right? So scatter plot relationship between uh, numerical variables. Line graph is sequential data. Bar chart is categorical data. And histogram is numerical data. And this is definitely one of those, uh, choose the best answer. Um, because obviously, uh, you know, scatter plot can be about sequential data as well, right? A histogram is kind of like categorical data. So best answer is the correct answer. All right. So what type of chart would we use to answer this question? Okay. So we have uh, a bunch of data about the weather. Okay. Um, and I even tried to do Celsius for like half a year. I never get my brain to work with it. It's just, I don't, there's not enough distinction between like 50 and 51. Well, you don't use these temperatures like that. But let's say 10 and 11, whereas you get a lot more distinction between on Fahrenheit. Maybe that's why. I really have no idea. Um, but so these are in Fahrenheit. Uh, so, you know, day 21. It was 72 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. Everybody know what that is in Celsius? For anyone who's not a typical user of Fahrenheit? Guesses? The rule of thumb is uh, zero is very cold, 10 is cold, 20 is warm, comfortable, 30 is hot. So it's going to be about between 20 and 30, probably closer to 20. But you can also do math, but whatever. All right. And then the low is 57. Um, so the high, basically, one of the things, uh, if you don't see these very often, a high is the uh, temperature that they expect it to reach in the course of 24 hours. As you might imagine, that typically happens during the day, because that's when the sun's out, right? And the low is the same thing, but the lowest point in 24 hours, that typically happens at night when the sun is not out. Um, but they are, a lot of people think that uh, the high is specifically about the day, but it's not. It's actually that 24-hour block. It just works out that it's during the day. And then what kind of uh, uh, weather we're going to have. So it's going to be sunny on day 21. Or sorry, it was sunny on 21. So how or what graph would we use to, uh, if, to figure out if there are more cloudy uh, versus sunny days? Any answers? A bar chart. That would be correct. Uh, all right. So you also have your hand up. Why is a bar chart? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So, because what we care about is the total number of sunny days versus cloudy days, not when they happen. Right. All right. Uh, and so, actually, I just answered my own question, I guess. Uh, so, let's do another one. Maybe. There we go. 
Okay, so what percentage of days have a high above 75 degrees Fahrenheit? What would be, a, so you could calculate this, right? But if you wanted to just have a graph that showed answers to this kind of question, what would be the best graph for that? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Histogram. That is correct. Um, and because what we can show is like we could define bins of like 70 degrees to 76 degrees, right? And we would have, um, you know, and then all the, or actually maybe we do 70 to 79. And so we'd have all the 70s in there, right? And then maybe you would do the same for 80 to 89. Um, that uh, last video I showed, she shows a really good example of, of how you can accidentally misinterpret a histogram because the bin sizes are different. Um, so do be careful of that, but point being uh, a histogram is the, the right answer. All right, so what kind of graph would I use to find out if hotter days also tend to have hotter nights, okay? Now, and put differently, whether a high, you know, the higher highs have higher lows. Any ideas? All right, scatter right on. Uh, so, you know, one for two, not bad. Uh, all right, cool. And so a scatter lets us see the, like things in relation to each other when they're numbers, right? So we get the highs kind of plotted there and then we'll see the lows and yes, they'll be lower, but we can see it, how the outliers look. All right, so now we move on to a demo. And because I have to have six, thousand windows open today. This might take just a minute. Uh... Actually, well, in the meantime, anybody have any questions? I'm gonna go with no. All right. All right, we run our first cell. All right, and now we're gonna load. Really? It's got, oh, got it. Thank you. All right, so as promised, um, this includes your answers uh, to anyone who filled out the survey. Um, it also includes uh, the last two semesters as well. Um, so we, we're starting to get a fair number of data. Um, it does, it's not quite, that because uh, from a data cleaning perspective, I get a whole bunch of horrible things if I was doing real data science. Okay, so I uh, so anybody who typed in because we got some answers that were like for sleep, we got between five and seven hours a night. So I just picked six, um, and then we also had things that were like uh, like one of the text e answers was too many, so I just picked twenty. Okay, so horrific, horrible things that you should never do, uh, but that's what I did. We also had people who didn't completely answer or it was like just the data was broken or whatever. So it's not perfect, but it gives the idea and it does actually involve all of you or anybody who filled in the survey. Um, so just by way of explanation, just in case, uh, handedness, so what's your preferred hand? Um, pant leg, which pant leg do you put on first? if you put on pants ever. Uh, sleep side, do you tend to sleep on your right side, your left side, your stomach, or your back? Um, and then M&M, &M, what's, the what's the best color? Because uh, of course they all taste completely differently or exactly the same, one of the two. 
Uh, programming is kind of what was your comfort level with programming in general, uh, one to five, five being high, uh, Python, same. Um, and then tech fees, I'm not sure why that came out being a decimal. I'll go back and look at it later or a float, I guess. Um, but basically it's like one to whatever uh, or zero, whatever actually. Um, and then sleep, uh, I didn't see anybody put in so far anything over 12 hours. That so far has been, I think the max. Um, but what's kind of cool about that, right? Is now we can actually start to think about what, you know, what is the state of telling us? So first up we have 126 records. Um, which we already knew, but you know, here's the easier way to get the answer. Um, so what if I wanted to make this bar chart, right? So I wanna make a horizontal bar chart, finding out uh, where I want two you know, bars, one of left-handed people and one of right-handed people. What would I do to get that? So you could pull those columns out, right? Into a new table. I'm gonna tell you, you don't need to. But that would be the first step. You still need to do the next step. What would be the next step? Oh, sorry. Okay, so, so that'll tell you, that'll get you the totals, right? But you really, you actually have that already, right? Because you could just, you know, select off the columns. You don't need to make a new table, but what can you do? What do you need to do in order to make a bar graph out of that data? We did this last lecture. Yeah, did you say group? Yeah, so use the group. Okay, what do you group? Right, so the handedness column. So um, I am going to do something that is not necessary, but might have led to the handedness, to led to some of the answers. Okay, and then handed. Okay, and then I think some, like a lot of you have done a lot of the project already. What should I put after this comma to group? What are my options? Why do I need where? But I'm not sorting them. All I want to do is group them, right? So I don't want to take any rows out, right? Unless maybe there's some bad data in there where, you know, somebody said, you know, left it blank or whatever, uh, but I cleaned all those out and made up answers. So uh, any other guesses? So would I want the sum? Okay, so you could. So you can add a method here. That is, what do you want to do to the group? Okay, but I don't want to do anything. I just want to count it. Okay, so I'm just going to do the count and then I can now have a bar graph. And so I see, unsurprisingly, not very many people are actually left-handed. Um, I'm actually very curious to see any statistics about this because there is a fair amount of theory that the left-handed percentage of the human population is actually quite a bit higher than we actually see in practice because so many schools uh, tend to not be uh, very supportive of people who are left-handed and teach them to be right-handed. Uh, and But naturally they're actually left-handed. Uh, this one is kind of interesting for me just because my left eye is dominant even though I'm right-handed, um, which can be confusing when you like wanna try to you know aim at something. All right, any questions? All right, so we can do some numerical histograms, maybe, but apparently, oh. I thought I ran. Oh yeah, okay. So so I have bugs in this one that are not in my original one. So um, I will try to correct them as we go, and that will be like the typing on ones that I uh, screwed up on. Um, but so, where's my mouse? Uh, okay, so 
right? So that data, even though it happens to be numbers, is actually categorical, right? There's not, there is a relationship between the one and the five, right? But it's really categories of, of people's Python skill, okay? Um, and also, unsurprisingly, we have a lot fewer people with any Python background whatsoever, okay? Which is kind of good, right? All right. And then I'm pretty sure this was wrong too. Yeah. Um, I generally do not like multi word column names. Um, so. So we can do the same thing with the amount of sleep people get. Um, and so you can see there's a lot of people who get between like seven and eight hours, right? A uh, fair number of six. Although I think this is. Yeah. So. Oh, sorry. Uh, what you're not seeing here is I actually, I think for the first time in this semester, um, I actually got decimals in some of the answers. So I got like 6.5 or whatever. So you're actually seeing uh, some of those halves in there as well. Um, but unsurprisingly, again, you would see most people are getting between seven and eight hours. Um, there's lots of new research that even though people say, you know, traditionally people say uh, eight hours is how much sleep you need, that it might be closer to seven. And it also varies wildly by age, um, you know, so you need significantly more sleep when you're small. Um, and then it kind of evens out to be maybe seven ish for a while. And then it actually drops off uh, as you get older. That was, that was interesting. All right, let me see what's next. All right, so. So if we wanted to find out what is the most sleep any uh, individual respondent said, what would we do? So I'm going to put it in a variable because I want to use it later, I think. So I'm going to call it that. And then I'm going to use a method. What's the method? Right on. So max survey column sleep. Okay, now I'm gonna do the same thing with the smallest amount, all right, for which I'm gonna use the min method. Survey column sleep. Uh, just be aware that not only at the podium do I tend to program out loud, I also do it at my desk when I'm by myself. Uh, so yeah, I talk to myself, it's okay. Uh, and then, Oh, I thought I had prints for both of those, but let's do max sleep. There we go, comma, min sleep. All right, and so the maximum we had in the table was 10, which we also saw in the graph, right? And the smallest number was four. All right. I think that might be reflective of you being college students, um, you know, because I don't know how you would manage to sleep 12 to 14 hours a day and also get all your work done. Okay, so um, what if what we wanted to do was uh, create a bar graph, right? Yeah, a bar graph of around kind of sleep side information, okay? So, oops, that was entirely in the wrong place. Good gracious, I have bad code news. Sorry, I just missed a step. Um, where'd it go? Actually, let's put it here. Um, so I pasted it, but. So I'm going to create sleep bins and very easily, right? I'm just going to do an A range between the minimum sleep hours and the maximum sleep hours and plus one. And then I'm going to step by two. Why do I do plus one? Right. So basically what I want to do is make it inclusive. So I need to add one to whatever the top is. All right. So I'm going to run that. Now this should work. Oh, of course not. Oh, is it? Thank you. All 
Well, it keeps you on your toes. All right, so that's a little bit better. Okay. However, what I also want to show here is I can actually do two different graphs, right? Um, in the same command so that I can kind of like see them side by side. On your computer, you can probably see them at the same time. You can actually make them appear next to each other. If they're small enough, it'll show up that way. Um, but uh, for the, on the slides or on the projector, it's harder. Um, so uh, that's kind of a, which side people tend to sleep on, okay? Um, but I think we have a, like a better comparison here that might be Oh, wait a minute. Oh, this is the wrong column. Uh, it's supposed to be on sleep side, not on sleep. Well, I don't, that's like, this isn't going to work. I don't think. This is a terrible example. Yeah, that's not going to work. Because um, you can't use. You can't use a bar graph right on uh, categorical data, so that's not going to work. All right. However, we should be able to get um, a bar graph out of it, which would be what I was actually talking about. Oh, sorry. Okay, so actually this is kind of a good point. So I tried to do this bar graph on the sleep side, but I have a lot of other columns in there. And so it's gonna freak out because I don't, um, I don't want them, right? I just wanna look at sleep side, um, but it's gonna try to do a bar graph for every column it can. So um, you can pass parameters to do it, but you can also do a trick like, um, is it? Select, yeah. I mix up column and select a lot. Oh, maybe somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe if I pass some prints. Yeah. What am I doing? Wait, well, I think that was how you did it, but we can cheat. Table with columns, and we'll just call it side, comma. I'm really not having a good day today. This is why I have a cheat sheet in advance. All right, I'm just gonna move on. I'll come back to it next time because I can't remember what I'm doing. There's a, I, I don't know about all of you, but it's hard when you're on stage to like think about what you're doing and like talk at the same time. So uh, sometimes I get confused. Um, so that's documentation for as far as I'm concerned. All right, so we'll go back to, the slides would be convenient if I had a nice little video right now to show, because then I could just talk through it. Um, or I could show it to you the demo while I, uh, or I could do the uh, video while I was trying to figure this out. All right, so you've already been using methods a little bit, okay? But what we wanna do here is talk about the formal definition of methods, okay? Um, so the first thing is, like I said, we use the terms method and function somewhat interchangeably. So def is short for define, okay? Think of another way of calling it is like that's, you know, you're naming something, okay? So you're defining a method called spread. It has 
uh, parameter called value, and then it is going to return a, you know, basically the result of another method of max minus min values. Um, so first up, does anybody here know what I mean if I say the word spread in a financial or sports context? Yeah, so yeah, but what does it mean? All right, so spread when you talk about sports betting or sports, it's the distance between the two final scores of the two teams. So if you take a soccer game and it's, you know, three to one, the spread would be two. Okay. And a lot of people will bet on the spread rather than bet directly on the actual value. Um, it, I, I see it a lot more commonly in financial markets because it's the spread of the like price of the start of the day and the end of the day for the stock, for example. All right. But so that's what a spread is. Very easy to calculate, as you might imagine, right? It's just the max minus the min. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I explained the stock one incorrectly. It's not the start of the day and the end of the day, it's the lowest and highest during the day. So during that day, it had this spread. But the minimum could have been at two in the afternoon, and the maximum could have been at two o two. Right? It doesn't matter when they are in the day. So we give a name and a method of the function, and then we have the argument names, okay, or parameter names. Again, argument and parameter are kind of used interchangeably. Um, and then my little blue box is core, but this whole thing is the body. I think we had a break in uh, top hat that is incorrect. Um, but so everything that's inside here is uh, part of the body. What I want to particularly point out though is notice how this is indented, okay? There's uh, a long running war on the internet of whether the thing that is here is a set of spaces or the tab character, all right? So does everybody know where the tab character is? Like you hit the tab key, okay? Um, most of the time, if you're doing Python development, those had better be spaces. Otherwise, they will make fun of you on the internet. So what, what's funny about this is it's so prominent that whatever you're using to write code in probably has an option somewhere that if you hit tab, what will show up, okay? So there's a lot of these wars in software development and the internet in general. Um, has anybody ever heard of Emacs versus DI? Literally no one. Okay, uh, so the two ancient granddaddies of the day of things that you edit files in, particularly code, one's called Emacs, one's called VI, um, and which one is better is been a battle that's been going on since, I think they were both started <clears throat> late 70s, maybe early 80s, uh, so it's been a while. Uh, Emacs is this big honking thing that does everything. VI is very minimalistic. minimalistic. Uh, Emacs actually comes by default with installed a little AI that acts like um, that will answer questions like a psychologist would. Like it's that big. Okay. People call it a whole operating system in and of itself. Um, all right. And then lastly, again, my little boxes are screwed up. Um, but the return expression is whatever is the right of the word return. So, does anybody here know what the word return does? Any guesses? It's right there in the word. Uh, right. So it returns whatever is to the right of it, basically. Now, the real question is, what does return mean? Like, okay. So what that means is, and you might have seen this in the project already, if you call a function, but give it a variable name first, right? So you say variable equals and then function, and then give it some parameters or whatever. Um, whatever is assigned to that name will be what is the result or the return value. That makes sense? So anything you want to get back to the outside of your method uses the return. All right. So. We'll come back to that. So functions, methods, like you said, a bunch of different things. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define a method called triple. It takes a single value, and then it returns that value multiplied by three, except I feel like, oh, no, that case thing is right. Okay. Looks like that was a capital X to me. Um, 
So I can easily call it. And so I do three and I'll get three times three, which is nine. And then, but I can also call it with a name. So you know all this, right? And we can just call it with whatever number. Um, we can also do an expression before it goes in by just putting it in here. Um, I will often, because I get paranoid that it's doing the thing that I want it to do, I'll actually often put another set of parentheses in there to make sure it happens first. Um, I do not recommend it, but just kind of that's the idea is like, if you're not sure it's really working right, you know, playing around with things like that until you figure it out, sometimes a good idea. However, the next thing I want to talk about is what's called scope. Okay. So does anybody know what I mean by scope? Okay. So the question is, does X have a value here? Anyway, do you have a theory? Will I, if I print X, will I get whatever, I guess, uh, you know, whatever the number that got passed in was, which would have been five times four. Uh, so 20, um, is that what X is equal to or not? Right, so it should give an error because I have not defined, unless I did something stupid, which is certainly plausible, I haven't defined X, okay? Because when I defined it inside this method, it is only within the scope of this method, okay? Um, this is one of those English words that I have a hard time remembering what it means in English, but in you know programming land, what we mean is like any kind of boxed area in a sense, right? So that method is like a box and in it, you have a bunch of, you know, variables, computations, you know, whatever. But as soon as you're done with it, as soon as you get past that return, all of it just gets thrown away. Okay, it does not, um, what they call leak into whatever called it. Okay, so X will not be, you or will not be defined because it's only defined within the scope of the method. Does that make sense? Okay. As you might imagine, because otherwise you'd very quickly run out of variables, right? Or you imagine a really big piece of software, you're gonna really collide on those variables all the time. Um, in fact, that's how a lot of old programming had to be done uh, back in the days before like modern programming language. So uh, scopes are important to remember. They usually don't come up because I feel like they're kind of logical. Like when you call that method, you kind of expect when you leave the method that everything that was there is gone, right? Um, and that's why you use the return because otherwise you wouldn't have any way to get any data out of the method. Make sense? All right, cool. All right. Uh, and then, okay. So we talked a little bit about types, okay, before. Um, and so type agnostic, okay means that 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 value that values thing on the method okay here it doesn't matter what it is that gets passed in okay it can be of any type however this will only work on some types right so that means two things one you can do something like triple talk and that should execute successfully, right? Because remember, if we multiplied a string by a number, we would get multiple copies of that string, right? However, if I pass in triple, you know, let's say table, it's gonna give an error because it's gonna try to multiply it by three and that's not gonna work, okay? However, we can do other things which are nice, which is, things like this, okay? So what do you expect that to do? Any ideas? Yeah. Right, so it's actually gonna operate the method on the array, right? Because just like we would do outside the method, if we uh, multiply an array by a number, it actually goes through each element of the array and then changes it. All right, so that's super handy. 
um, that it, it will just try pretty much everything. Is Chris able at some time to enable the one event? No, it would if you pass the one col like the column as an array, but it wouldn't it wouldn't work for the table. Just like if I type, oops, uh, like if I did, um, what was the, yeah, so if I did um, survey select, uh, see, Python was numerical, right? Times, whatever it was. Three. Okay. But if I do column, this is what I was screwing up before, that does work because it's, I turned it into an array before trying to multiply. It. What? Right. Right. Well, it's just, yeah, technically it's the same array, but yeah. I mean, it's a copy, but um, all right. So. Where? So obviously this is, I don't know why I labeled this discussion question because it's really more of a, an example, um, but you can have, wow, I really jumped windows there a lot, hold on one second. So you can have much more complex methods, right? And now what's nice about this is now I have this kind of bundled up in a method. So I don't have to have this whole thing every time I want to operate it. So what I can do, I'm just going to cut and paste this because we're running out of time. All right, is like, it'd be really kind of annoying to try to do this on this array directly. So instead I can make a method that will do it kind of all at once um, and then just return the result that I want. Of course, it's not going to work. Oh, I didn't run it yet. So, you know, so it does the same thing, but it makes it a lot easier to read, easier to understand. And then, and the key here, this isn't the best example of this, but the key here is that if you had a mistake in here, okay, let's say something really dumb, like, you know, you had negative 100, okay? What's super nice about it being in a method is that all the places that you use percent of total, like, you know, yeah, you used it four times here, but maybe you used it a bunch of other places in the notebook and, you know, whatever. And then you finally go back and you realize that you had this thought, okay, you had this error. So if you just change it here, it's now fixed for everywhere. Okay. So it's a really good way to say, oh, I keep doing this same thing. Let me just put that in a method for two things. One, it's easier to use, right? You can just call it now. And if you have a bug in it, you can change it 